Hello, everyone. Welcome to the CLS Chinese informational webinar, and we are going to get started in just a few minutes. Just want to allow a little bit more time for attendees to enter the webinar virtual room here. So please stay tuned and we'll get started soon. And for those of you just joining us, we're going to get started here in just a moment or two. Uh, I still see quite a few people entering our webinar right now, so I just want to give another minute uh, for us to get more people in here before we get started so that no one misses any really important information. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and get started with our presentation here. So thank you everybody for joining us today for the CLS Chinese informational webinar. My name is Chris Stiles. I am the Senior Program Officer for Chinese here at American Councils. And I am also pleased to welcome here today uh, two alumni of our CLS Chinese program. We have uh, Patrick Thompson and Preston Simonek who participated in not one, but two CLS programs, and they're going to share a little bit with you today. I've been actually working on the Critical Language Scholarship for four years now, and I actually started as a resident director in Suzhou, China, working overseas on the program, and I, I led a cohort on the program there, and so it's been a great opportunity to kind of work on the program from both sides, and so right now I'm going to let uh, Patrick and Preston introduce themselves. So they'll just talk about uh, when and where they participated in CLS and uh, also the university that they're from and what they're doing now. So let's start with Patrick. Patrick, I think you're, uh, you might be muted or don't have audio. Oh no, you weren't muted. Can you hear me? I can hear you, Preston. Okay, I, uh, I'll try to go ahead and get started then um, while Patrick's figuring it out. Okay. Um, hi everybody, I'm Preston. Uh, I did the CLS program to Tainan in 2020 in Taiwan and then to Dalian in China in 2021. I'm a recent graduate um, of the Air Force Academy in Colorado Springs and I just finished my initial flight training and I'll be going on to be a pilot in the Air Force. I hope to use Chinese um, 
down the line as a foreign area officer, so acting as a, a military government liaison to Taiwan or China. Great, thanks for being here, Preston. And uh, Patrick, are, is your audio working now? Can you hear me now, Chris? Yes, I hear you, great. Uh, awesome, sorry about that, everyone. So, uh, hello everyone, my name is Patrick Thompson and I am an alumnus of CLS 2020 at Dalian Institute of Technology, located at, uh, obviously, Dalian, China, and CLS 2021 at National Chenggong University at Tainan, Taiwan. I am a fourth year electrical engineering and mathematics student at the University of Massachusetts, located at beautiful Amherst, Massachusetts, right next to my hometown. Uh, I am honored to be on this panel and I look forward to sharing my experiences with everyone. All right, great. So we are gonna hear from Patrick and Preston a little bit later, but first uh, we'll just give you a few details about the program. So we'll start with an overview, including a few specific details about our Chinese program. Uh, at the end, I am going to answer any questions that anyone has about CLS and the application process. So if you have questions, please feel free to type them into the Q&A box here in Zoom. Uh, please type them in the Q&A box as opposed to the chat, because that way we'll be able to uh, see which questions we've gotten more easily and, and organize them. So uh, if you have a Q&A window, you should be able to find it in your Zoom. And so feel free to ask any questions there, and we will answer those at the end of this presentation. And if you have any questions that are specific to Preston or Patrick, of course, please feel free to ask them questions too as, because they're gonna stick around at the end of the presentation to answer some questions. All right, so let's move on now. So first of all, you should know that CLS is a fully funded summer study abroad program, and it does support students in all fields of study to learn what the US Department of State refers to as critical languages. Um, and we, I'm sure you may have questions as to what critical languages are, um, but I can just say generally, these are languages for which we need Americans to speak these languages in many different fields. And so the critical languages are generally languages that aren't necessarily taught very commonly in high schools and universities. So they are harder to get, uh, to get Americans to study these languages in, in many of the cases. Um, and they are also languages for which people are just needed generally for positions in a variety of different roles. And, uh, and that can include you know, jobs in different industries um, or for the federal government. And uh, Chinese is just one of the 15 languages offered through the program. So let's talk about some of the benefits of the program. Um, first of all, it is fully funded by the US Department of State. It covers domestic travel from each participant's home to the US, uh, to Washington. Uh, in the past, we've, we've done a pre-departure orientation. This year, actually, it's going to be a virtual orientation. So we will cover airfare from your hometown to your destination city. Um, and that, in, that includes round trip international airfare. The program covers uh, any visa fees, if applicable, which is the case for mainland China and uh, may actually be the case for Taiwan as well uh, this time around. It also covers room and board for uh, living in, in this case, it's typically going to be in an apartment uh, style hotel or a dormitory. And it covers cultural activities in and around the host country. Um, alumni of the program will receive undergraduate credit through Bryn Mawr College as well as a certified ACTFL OPI test. ACTFL is the American Council on the Teaching of Foreign Languages. So OPI is the oral proficiency interview, which is a standardized test um, that helps to rate your language ability. And uh, you'll, re you'll receive a certification for that to rate your language progress. So let's talk a little bit about why Chinese would be a good language to learn. Oh, sorry, skipping ahead here. Didn't mean to do that, okay. So um, first of all, I think it's easy to see actually why Chinese is in such high demand in the world with growing economies in locations such as China, of course, and, uh, but you know, of course, other locations around Asia, Malaysia, Singapore, Taiwan, um, and all of these feature Mandarin Chinese as a key component. As technology continues to connect the East and the West, more Americans are learning Chinese in order to engage effectively in the global marketplace and pursue international careers in diverse fields such as finance, technology, 
health and even the arts. And I have a musical background myself and I can, you know, and I can say that Chinese has been useful for me to collaborate with other musicians. Um, the CLS program teaches students Mandarin Chinese while providing opportunities for students to engage with China and Taiwan's diverse local culture. Now the CLS program is taught in Mandarin, not to be confused with Cantonese, no Cantonese offered yet, but uh, uh, simplified characters are typically used as the standard instruction for all CLS Chinese institutes. Students who have been studying traditional characters, which is used more widely in Taiwan, are of course welcome to apply for the program and can continue studying traditional characters if they so choose concurrently with the simplified characters. Uh, it is beneficial to students to be able to read simplified characters since these are predominantly used around the world in publications and correspondence. The CLS Chinese program is open to students at approximately the intermediate level and to be eligible for Chinese students are required to have completed the equivalent of two academic years of prior study at the university level. Um, so while many students meet these requirements through formal classes at the college level, you may substitute other language learning experience for formal classes, such as self-study, tutoring, high school coursework, uh, of course, discount, or knowledge of the language from your home environment. So we are uh, um, accepting and welcoming of heritage learners. There is space in the application for you to describe your language learning experience and how it meets the proficiency requirement for the level to which you are applying. In any case, you must have a plan to meet the requirement by the beginning of June when the CLS program starts. So just to be clear about this, you don't have to have met that requirement when you apply, but you have to have met the requirement when you actually participate in the program. So if you are in Chinese 201 right now and you plan to take 202 in the spring, you are eligible for the program. I just wanna be clear about that because sometimes um, applicants do get confused about that. And we don't want anybody that might be eligible to rule themselves ineligible. Previous study does not need to appear on an academic transcript, but you do need to be at the appropriate level. So um, we like to say it's really to your benefit not to try and game the system. We have some tips on our website to help you determine what level you should apply to based on your experience. There is no test for the application or selection, but students will complete a placement test once they have been placed in a program site if they are selected as finalists. And at that time, students will be placed in a level which corresponds with their ability. There are no beginner levels offered for Chinese, so that is why it is important to be sure you are at the intermediate level or above to participate successfully. We definitely don't want anybody to be struggling on the program. So, CLS scholars participate together in the program as a cohort. CLS is a group program, and in a way it makes it distinct from many other um, study abroad scholarships. Uh, so everyone will share the same weekly schedule, which consists of 20 hours of language classes, cultural activities and local excursions, and weekend overnight group trips. I do wanna add that there may be uh, changes to that cultural excursion policy due to the impacts of COVID-19. Um, in the past, um, when, when we did have in-person programs, we did curtail that and instead made it a one-day activity uh, since there are a, a lot of complications involved in staying overnight outside of the host city. Um, so that may be the case in the upcoming program. I also do want to point out that for virtual programs, um, the hours face-to-face -face hours are a little bit different. It's 10 hours per week of language classes. Um, and I know a lot of people are probably wondering, you know, what are the chances that CLS programs would be virtual versus in-person? And I can say that we are aiming to have as many of our programs as possible in person. So if we can make it happen, we are doing our best to make it happen. There is a possibility though, and we are transparent about it. There could be a, it could be that the entire program is virtual or perhaps there might be a virtual component for part of the program. And so there may be some differences in what you see on this slide. Um, I, I also wanna point out that the program is designed for maximum language gains and cultural immersion. So during the in-person programs, there is a language policy in place, which requires that all participants speak only in Chinese while they are on the program. That includes, of course, in the classroom, but in all common areas, in the hallways, on the campus grounds, in the cafeteria, uh, in the dormitory, 
So does that mean that you can't call your parents on the phone and speak in English when you're in your dorm? Yes, you can. We just ask that you be discreet about it. And so not speaking on the phone in English in front of all of the other students in your cohort, but instead doing so privately in your dormitory. Um, but, but in terms of in general, in all the common areas, it is expected you speak in Chinese and it is enforced. Uh, another great benefit of the program, I would say, as well as a component, is that all scholars will have a language partner assigned to them. That's whether it's in-person or a virtual program, you will have a language partner assigned to you. Uh, and of course, the language of policy applies there. All conversations with your language partner will be in Chinese, but they are also a really great cultural guide. But also don't discount the fact that you are also a cultural guide to them and that cultural exchange is a two-way street. And it is a great opportunity to have some really fascinating conversations and learning. So now let's talk a little bit about the Chinese program's structure uh, and format a little bit more. As I mentioned, you will be paired with a language partner. And so you're gonna have an opportunity to practice talking outside of a classroom there with a native speaker. Typically um, that is arranged so that students will meet with their language partner for a minimum of three hours per week. Most students do that by breaking it into two sessions of an hour and a half per session, but that's up to you to work out with your language partner. You may, you may have a different scheme. Uh, and of course, if your language partner is willing and you have a, a great relationship with them, you're welcome to exceed the three hours per week and meet other times as well. And a lot of students find that just chatting with their language partner on a chat app, which would be WeChat in mainland China or Line in Taiwan is also a great benefit, just having conversations in the digital world. Um, but face-to-face -face meetings are a requirement. So you can't like text your language partner in lieu of that. Um, it's also a great opportunity to, as I mentioned, to gain personal insight into the host culture. Um, and even for the virtual programs, we found that students were able to work out some virtual types of meetings with their language partners so that they could, say, show them around each other's homes or perhaps show them around each other's hometowns. Um, for example, there was a language partner in Taiwan who took their U.S. Uh, US based CLS partner to a night market in Taiwan and show them around the night market. So there are some, some great possibilities, even with a virtual program. And actually, you know what, while we're on the subject, I would like to ask Patrick and Preston, maybe you can share a little bit about what your language partner experience was for the virtual programs, since I think a lot of uh, people in our audience would be curious exactly how that would work. Yeah, so I've had a very pleasant experience with my language partners. Uh, my first language partner in 2020, uh, she was great. Uh, we would always talk about just our daily lives and it was a really great way to know about the culture of China on a more intimate level than just reading it in class and whatnot. Uh, my second language partner from Tainan is, he was great. He was also an engineering student. So it was really beneficial for me to talk about that subject with him and kind of challenge my vocabulary a lot more as I tried to say things like uh, capacitors, uh, currents, radio frequencies. Like these are words that you don't, obviously don't come up in daily conversation a lot, but are very beneficial for my major. So having uh, someone to speak with about that was awesome. And uh, I think what's great about the language partners is, you know, like I said, anyone can just read about the culture of China in a textbook or maybe watch a documentary about it, but not everyone gets the opportunity to truly approach Chinese culture like you can with a language partner. You get to know more about it on a much more intimate level. And through this, you understand it a lot more inherently than someone who only goes to class. Plus you get to make some close friends, which in my mind is pretty cool. Uh, I actually still regularly talk with my language partner from Tainan. We speak uh, at least once a week for about an hour and I help him improve his English and he helps me improve my Chinese. So it's a beneficial, it's mutually beneficial. And we've been doing this you know, months since the program's end. Uh, again, like I said, it's great since we're both engineering students. So we have a lot of common ground to cover and we both have uh, mutual goals of trying to work in each other's respective countries. So we're able to lift each other up in that mind. And that's what I love about the language partners. And I really hope that one day I can go to Taiwan and visit him. I already have plans for it, but we just got to wait and see how things, things work out. Yeah, to echo what Patrick was saying, the um, as part of the um, pre-program process that you'll do for CLS, you'll like write a letter about your interests and who you are and things like that. And then CLS will, uh, the host sites will pair you up with a language partner who would like best match your interests and needs. 
So when, uh, when I did it the first year, um, me being a future pilot, I was paired with an aeronautical engineering student in Taiwan. So we had a lot of uh, commonalities to talk about there. And um, you can do a surprising amount of things virtually. For instance, uh, my language partner was like one of the single digit best badminton players in Taiwan. So he took me to his gym and like showed me around. I was like, wow, this is so interesting. I know some other people even did things like play chess or um, other other games or uh, one person took their uh, CLS participant onto a boat ride at Sun Moon Lake in Taiwan. So there's a surprising amount of things you can do and they're generally pretty um, nice, friendly people. And they, it's a very competitive uh, selection process to become a language partner. So you'll be in, in really good hands. It's, it's more of a benefit to you than you'd think. Thanks, Patrick and Preston. And yeah, I can say, you know, we get surveys from students and almost consistently language partners is always one of the most top rated aspects of the program. And, and we just get lots of glowing reviews from students. So I think it's um, something that you'll enjoy quite a lot. All right, next, we're going to talk a little bit more, uh, some details that I think you'll find interesting about the program. And so let's first talk about where we have hosted the program in the past. In 2021, we had some virtual sites that were hosted in Changchun at Changchun uh, Humanities and Sciences College and Dalian University of Technology, uh, National Chenggong University in Tainan, and Danjiang or Tamkang is it spelled in English uh, at New, in New Taipei. Um, and these were virtual sites. We do anticipate if we are able to deliver in-person sites that these would likely be the same, um, but there is also a possibility that they would change. I should also point out that students don't get to choose the site where they are placed, but rather CLS will place students at each site based on a variety of factors. And the reason for this is that it's important for CLS cohorts to be balanced according to factors such as field of study, university level, Chinese language level, experience, studying or traveling abroad, and other facets that allow for diverse perspectives that re represent the US as broadly as possible. Uh, all sites will have a variety of cultural excursions, whether they are in person, we'll have, um, we will have excursions. Uh, if it's virtual, it would be more activities or virtual excursions. Um, and for the in-person programs, it's typically two excursions locally, and then one excursion that takes place away from the city. If it's possible to do an overnight excursion, that is what is typical in our programs. But again, because of the impacts of COVID-19, it might be a, a day-long excursion. Um, so you can see an example of an excursion shown in this picture, actually, where students visited a pastry factory and had the opportunity to make their own Chinese desserts, or tianpin, uh, for those of you studying Chinese. So while learning about the company's business model and manufacturing process, um, it was just a great opportunity to have some insight into that, that aspect. Uh, other excursions may involve traveling to a place of historic or cultural significance, such as a village or a temple. Um, and now for the virtual perspective, I'm going to have Patrick and Preston share about a cultural excursion they experienced or an activity, cultural activity um, that they experienced on the, the virtual programs. Yeah, so during the virtual program, uh, we did several different activities. Uh, from my memory in 2020, uh, we did a karaoke day, which I personally enjoyed quite a lot. We all got to go on camera and sing a Chinese song and it was, it was a ton of fun. I had a blast. Uh, we also did Chinese cooking, where we all tried to go into our kitchen and cook some food. Uh, the Chinese teacher was teaching us, uh, walking us step through step through the whole process. That was a ton of fun, too. Uh, and then there was tea time. So we went through the entire Chinese tea ceremony online. Uh, in Tainan, we had, Tainan was a kind of a different uh, format than what we did in 2020. So we had to sign up for these in advance, and we can kind of choose which ones we went to. Uh, I was really interested in all of them. So I signed up for as many as I could. Uh, the ones I went to was a bubble tea session. So we got to speak with the owner of a bubble tea shop in, in Tainan, which was really interesting to learn about kind of like the business aspects of it. So if you are you got an entrepreneurial mindset and you want to apply Chinese to that, that's definitely something that would be beneficial to those people. I thought what I thought was most interesting was we had a professor. I think he was a professor at a university talk about uh, earthquakes in Tainan. And it was uh, very difficult because 
he, I think he almost forgot that we were Chinese students. So he was talking as he was almost giving a lecture to uh, master, or I to say a native PhD student. So it was kind of challenging for my Chinese, but again, very beneficial and very informative. And then we had another, I think he was an engineer, I honestly can't quite remember, talk about wind farms in Taiwan. So all these things I find very interesting as an engineer, lots of new vocabulary I learned and very informative to hear about everything going on in Taiwan. So I really enjoyed it. Um, as Patrick was saying, there's a, a really large diversity of cultural experiences that you'll get to do. In, in Taiwan, we were broken into small groups and you could select one of three different cultural activities based on the Chinese level. So you could choose a 200 level cultural activity or 300 level or 400 level. So it was, it was kind of cool that you could switch up your, your language level. And then some of my uh, favorite topics in that was one, learning Taiwanese in Chinese. I'd never learned a language in another language before. So that was, that was really cool. Um, and then second, uh, I, I did a Chinese humor cultural activity. So we learned about some of the ways that uh, Chinese humor differs from English humor and learned some funny little jokes. We like came to class prepared with jokes, translated them into Chinese and then told them in front of the class. In, in China, it was more of a, uh, everybody will receive the same cultural activity, at least in Dalian. And there I thought one of the really interesting ones was a, a poverty alleviation program in, in China. So we went to a farm and virtually, and we, we saw the different farming methods they had out in the countryside, growing the different plants. It was really interesting. Yeah, thank you. And so, yeah, uh, virtual does offer a lot of possibilities. Um, and so, you know, it, it's just great to keep that in mind if it, it does end up that some programs in, end up being in a virtual format, it still is a fantastic way to, to learn the language and have some cultural engagement or some opportunities for cultural engagement. And speaking of which, I wanna talk about a few more benefits of the program. One of course, is that you're going to make rapid language gains. And so over the course of one summer, you really get about a year's worth of learning and it's pretty amazing. We test students, as I mentioned, with the OPI before and after the program. So we really do see the gains. We've got the data to back it up as well. Um, and also, you know, this really opens doors to further academic and employment opportunities in all fields to have these language skills. Studying abroad can help you develop and hone skills that all employers are looking for, like problem solving, flexibility, and adaptability. Um, especially, you know, working together with a, with a cohort of people from across the United States uh, and you're adapting to, to really interacting with students from the U.S., but also at the same time adapting to living in a foreign country. Um, and even for the virtual program, you know, it's still a great benefit just to be able to meet people from diverse perspectives all across the country and learn Chinese together. Um, and this experience really helps you stand out to employers to give you an edge in an increasingly competitive and globalized job market. Because of the immersive nature of the CLS program, participants do have unique opportunities to build meaningful relationships in the host communities with friends and colleagues from the host country, as well as peers in their CLS cohorts who come from all over. Alumni of the program join a vibrant and engaged community of US Department of State International Exchange alumni. So you will actually get access to the resources and events that are supported by the CLS program. Uh, and while CLS participants have no service commitment to the US government after completion of the program, you do actually get a certificate of non-competitive eligibility for federal employment. So this gives you a little bit of a leg up in the hiring process for federal positions uh, in that you can be hired directly without having to be without having to compete with a pool of applicants. Um, now, of course, you still have to have all of the requirements for the job and they have to, to be uh, willing to hire you, but it does give you an advantage and it's an advantage for uh, federal agencies to be able to hire directly because it saves them time as well. All right, so the only way that you will be able to participate into the, to, in this program is, of course, to apply. And the application is now live at clscholarship.org apply. And uh, you can see the link right there on your screen, as well as a 
QR code. In order to prepare a competitive application, we do recommend starting right away and reaching out to resources on your campus for help. We do find typically the, the applications that are successful are the ones where the applicant sought help. So your application must be submitted no later than 5 o'clock p.m. Pacific time or 8 o'clock p.m. Eastern time on Tuesday, November 16th. You may apply for only one language, and please keep in mind that you are applying for a language rather than a location. Applicants are required to submit an unofficial transcript and one recommendation. Four short essays and a statement of purpose form the core of the application. And right now, we're going to give you an opportunity to hear some tips and strategies for your application directly from two students who successfully applied from the program. So right now, I would like to turn it over to Patrick and Preston to just talk about their CLS experience, talk about a bit about you know, why they applied, uh, but also talk about the application process and what are some things that you think helped make your application successful that you think would, be, would benefit others attending this session? I can go ahead and start, Chris. So I think broadly start in advance, um, get people to review it. But I think one of the biggest aspects that people often miss in applying for language programs is that you're not just going to be a robot, uh, a, a translating Chinese robot. You're going to be a representative of, in this case, the US government. So I think if you could find ways in your application to show that you have a good head on your shoulders, to show that um, you can both bring uh, US culture um, abroad and represent it well, as well as uh, you have the intellectual ability to um, take what you've learned abroad and bring it back to the United States. Um, that cross-cultural exchange is a really big part of the critical language scholarship. Just a quick example of that. Um, I went to Taiwan in person through my school before CLS. And there I got a case of culture shock because things were so different between Taiwan and the US. And uh, when it came to a head, I realized that things were so different, uh, not because one way was better than the other or worse than the other, but just because uh, Taiwan and the United States had different starting positions. And the culture that they developed was an outpouring of of what those cultures started like and what their geopolitical situations were, uh, how their transportation modes different, differed. And I was able to talk to that in my application and show that I, I could really find some of the, the niche cultural differences and think critically about what I saw while abroad. All right, so. I want to talk about like why I applied for CLS and I applied for CLS because I'm very passionate about learning Chinese. Uh, it is my absolute goal to uh, get to fluency in Chinese. And I also really like engineering. So it just seemed like a no brainer for me to combine the two of them into a lasting career. In the future, I hope to work for US uh, companies with close ties to Chinese manufacturers and to kind of act as a technically competent liaison between the two of them, uh, go between uh, American design and Chinese manufacturing. And uh, for my essays, uh, I've had a lot of different help. I, I have a lot of help in my essays. Uh, I wrote up different drafts on different themes and I had as many different people as possible look over them for errors and help me pick out the best theme. Uh, my school at the time didn't have an official CLS advisor. Uh, so I just kind of messaged advisors at neighboring schools. And to my surprise, most of them were actually willing to help out with me despite me not being a student there. Uh, so they looked over my essays, helped me pick out the best themes, and I went with that. Uh, I even cold messaged alumni uh, of CLS on Facebook, uh, asked them for some tips, what their experiences were like, and if they had the time and were willing to look over my essays. Uh, that's something you can do. Definitely go on the CLS website and look at the alumni ambassadors, and I'm sure most of them will be willing to help out. Uh, perhaps my biggest tip for applicants on your essays is to focus on the big picture, and that is, why are you studying Chinese? What do you hope to accomplish in the future? And how will CLS help you achieve that goal? Uh, my first two years applying to CLS, I was actually rejected. And in hindsight, it was because I spent way too long just talking about my passion for Chinese. And I never went anywhere with it. 
So cool. I like Chinese, but why would CLS want to invest in me versus the thousands of other applicants who wrote about the same thing? So I spent those two years really looking deep inside me about what I want to do with my future. And, uh, and by the third year, I had a really strong application that really hammered in what I wanted to do for a career. It almost read like a professional project proposal where I list out what I plan to do from A to B to C and why CLS is an essential part of this plan. And, and this is something to keep in mind when you write your essays in that CLS and the State Department are dishing out a lot of money to send you abroad. And they really want to ensure that eventually they will see a return on investment, whether it's a, an economic goal, a diplomatic goal, an academic goal, or really any goal. Focus on the bigger picture and really kind of hammer that in on your essays. And I think you'll be successful if you do that. Thanks, Patrick and Preston. That is really excellent advice. And so I hope everybody is, is taking that in. And it really is great to be introspective and spend some time just thinking about connecting this language learning to your goals and, and really kind of fleshing out what your goals are. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about what makes a strong candidate. And so we are uh, revealing some secrets of the application process just for you. So uh, it is important to note that applicants for the CLS program do come from a wide range of backgrounds and are excited to repres represent the diversity of the United States abroad. And I, I just want to share, you know, kind of a personal example um, of myself when I did doing when I did outreach, something that I learned doing outreach um, in different parts of the country. That, uh, for example, in the Midwest, um, there are, it is often the case that students are a bit more shy about talking about themselves, uh, and and there's you know this idea of of humility, of course, is very important, and not uh, being arrogant or overconfident. Uh, and I do wanna say that in the application, it really, it's really important that you do talk about yourself and that you do not discount any aspect of your background. So definitely don't be, don't be afraid to talk about yourself. Don't overlook something that might really make you unique as well. I remember once talking to a student who had applied for Chinese and, and didn't get in. And, and I asked the student a little bit about themselves uh, to learn about them. And I found out that the student grew up uh, in a, in a farming family. And I, and I said, well, that's really interesting. You know, I don't meet too many students with that background. Uh, and I asked them if they talked about it in their application and they said, no. And I told them, well, okay, there's, that's what you did wrong right there. You've got to talk about that because that's, that's something that gives you a unique perspective. So think about not just who the people around you and your community are, but think about who you're going to be competing with across the country for this opportunity and think about what might make you stand out. It may be that your community itself is what makes you stand out. So really try to see the bigger picture in terms of who else is applying. Uh, I do wanna point out that the program places an emphasis on students who are prepared for the rigorous academic program and the intensive nature of the program. So giving examples of how you're ready for that is a great thing to include in your application. Um, it is important to show that you can succeed in the CLS program. And that includes addressing your ability to study intensively and your skills at adapting to a group program setting where you're not making all the decisions and your cultural flexibility and maturity. You should know that you are motivated that to pursue a language study and that you will continue your studies after you return to the United States. Follow through is something that is very highly valued by the Department of State. So this does, doesn't have to mean that your campus has to offer courses in the language you choose, but it's, you should have a plan for how you'll continue learning the language in the future. So for example, if, you, uh, if your school doesn't necessarily have advanced Chinese courses uh, after you've completed the program, it's, it's helpful for you to show how are you going to continue on your own to expand your language skills and to flesh that out in your application. And of course, make a clear connection between your language and your academic or professional career goals, and especially the career goals. I know that not everybody may have those completely fleshed out, especially if you're a freshman, um, but it is good, a good idea to do some research and start exploring some possibilities and at least um, talk about some of those possibilities in your application. All right, so now let's talk about the timeline. The application is due on November 16th at eight o'clock p.m. Eastern time, that's five o'clock, uh, Pacific time. And so your recommendation deadline is due just a few days later on November 19th. And the 
semifinal finalist notification will happen in January. You don't have to do anything after you've received that notification. It's really just telling you where you are. Following that notification, uh, the finalists will be notified in March. And then the programs begin in June. So again, there is the place to apply at the bottom of your screen there and a nice little QR code. And now we are going to open it up to any questions that you have. So we have quite a few questions that are piling up here. And I see that Preston and Patrick have been helping to, to type some answers to some of the questions. So we'll, uh, we'll look at the questions that we have here. Uh, it looks like Preston is typing an answer to a question right now. Uh, let's start with this question. Uh, give me just a moment. I've got a long question here. So I, I've got to take a moment to see if this is something we can answer today. Um, and if we can't answer it today, then, then we, we do have an email address right there on the screen that you can write to CLS at AmericanCouncils.org. Um, so with, for complex questions that we might not be able to answer today, you, you can write to us uh, and we will respond to you. Okay, uh, a student has a question about testing out of a language and uh, whether they would be able to participate in the program if they don't necessarily have the full two years of study. And uh, the answer is uh, you have to have two years equivalent of study. So that means that if you, if you do test out, if your language ability, if you can demonstrate with your language ability that you have acquired at least two years worth of Chinese through whatever that means that is, um, it's just incumbent upon you to outline that in your application and how that happened and, and why you think that meets the two-year requirement. Um, and, and in some of these situations, the, the, the eligibility will be determined on a case-by-case -case basis. But generally speaking, you know, if a student were to, for example, participate in an intensive program like CLS that covers a year's worth of curriculum in eight weeks, that would count as a year. Um, so that, that it is important to know that. So it doesn't necessarily have to be uh, the amount of time expressly, but it does have to be the equivalent of about two years of college study. So again, it's just important for you to outline in your application how you met that requirement. All right, we have a question. Uh, if applying for the CLS scholarship this month, and between the time when the application deadline closes and the departure from the US, you need to cancel the program. Would you still be eligible, eligible to apply next year and be considered equally as likely to receive another scholarship? Uh, yes, you'll have an, actually an opportunity to accept or decline the award. And so once you're selected, if you choose to decline the award, there are no penalties whatsoever for that. And it does not count against you for future applications. Um, it becomes a little bit more complicated if you have to withdraw from the program, um, and it just depends on the circumstances of that and how late the withdrawal occurs. Um, another question is whether a homestay is an option for housing accommodation. Typically, we would have homestays for the CLS program. Unfortunately, due to the impacts of COVID-19, it has been determined that in the 2022 program, there will not be homestays in the program. Um, we do hope to resume that in future years, but there will be no homestays for 2022. Uh, we have a question uh, from a heritage speaker who, uh, who learned Cantonese and how they would address that relevance in the application. And that's a great question. And we do have quite a few uh, past successful applicants who have done a good job of expressing that in their application. And so, you know, it's, it's uh, again, you know, that is a piece of the overall application. And this could be something about talking about your perspective, but it, the, the most important thing to discuss is why you're, why you're learning Mandarin, why that's relevant for you uh, and how you expect to use it in the future. Uh, another question is when students will find out if the program is virtual or in-person. And that's a great question. Um, so generally, by the time students are notified as finalists, there will be a determination um, as to whether sites are in person or virtual at that time. However, I do want to also stipulate that uh, this can change if 
the COVID situation changes. So generally a virtual program will not be switched to an in-person program. So once there's been a decision about a virtual program, it will be a virtual program that will not reverse. Um, for in-person programs, however, these can change to virtual if there is, for example, a COVID spike in the country uh, or the country imposes new restrictions, which doesn't allow us to get visas for the students or if there are other just general concerns about students' health and safety. So um, that, is, that is a possibility. But, but generally, you know, the initial decisions will be communicated to students when they are notified. Ah, I have a question about whether there will be a recording of this session. And the answer is yes. Uh, look for a recording of this session. If you missed the first part, uh, coming, it'll, it'll come online on the events part of our website. So if you go to our website, go down to events and go down to the very bottom, you'll see recordings of these webinars. And this webinar should go up um, in a day or two after this session. And we have a question, is only one recommendation form allowed? That is correct. Uh, it is only one recommendation and we are only able to allow one recommendation just because we don't have the practical ability to receive other recommendations. So please choose one and choose wisely. Um, so we had a question about main points applicants need to include in their statement. So on the application itself, it will have a very clear set of prompts. So please do follow all of the prompts uh, and those will be your main points. Uh, we have a question from a non uh, about whether a non-degree student can apply for this program. Unfortunately, not uh, eligibility requires that a student be degree seeking, and that is a hard requirement. Um, but I do really want to emphasize that we do uh, accept students applying for associate's degrees at community colleges. So community colleges, com community colleges, community college students, you are welcome. Uh, we want to make that really clear, abundantly clear that we welcome community college students to apply for this program. Uh, and a question about when results, when students will know results. We did mention that in the, time, in the timeline slide, you'll find out whether you're a semifinalist sometime in January, and then you'll find out if you're a finalist sometime in March. Ah, there's a great question here about if there's a preference over public or private sector career interests. And the answer is no. Uh, this is definitely not by any means a program that emphasizes public sector career interests over private sector. We really want to uh, have Americans speaking Chinese in all sectors. So, uh, so I would say they're equally valued and really, you know, in particular pushing for a lot of those private sector career interests because we do, in, we do see quite a few applicants who do want to work in the federal government and that's great. And, and of course, many of those applicants will be successful, but there is also great, great value to students working in the private sector, you know, especially in the STEM fields, in engineering and technology and health. Uh, so, so that is important to keep in mind. All right, and several questions about the recording. I just wanna reiterate the recordings available on our website under events at the bottom of the page. You will find it there uh, under recordings. Uh, I have a question of, of students going from semifinalist to finalist, and what is the process of selection? And that's a great question. So your initial applications will, will be scored by readers from across the country. These will be experts in universities. Uh, in some cases, they, they are study abroad or fellowships advisors. They are language teachers uh, or faculty, other faculty members, um, or perhaps area experts. So. Um, so, your, so the applications will be scored by multiple readers in the first round. And then the finalists from that round will then go to selection panels. And selection panels are comprised uh, of these same types of experts. Again, you know, study abroad, fellowships advisors, um, language professors, area experts uh, on faculties at universities and colleges across the United States.
And there's a question about how many will get selected for this program. So um, that, that there's not an exact number, but we can generally say that uh, out of five to 6,000 applications each year, typically around 550 finalists are selected for the programs. For Chinese, uh, it is usually around 100 or so. Oh, uh, a really great question about where to find contact info for their CLS program advisor uh, from other schools or in your school. So that is available on our website. If you go, actually, you know what? Let me see if I can just share my screen. I think this is great to show everybody because I definitely want you to know where to find that information because we encourage students to seek out their advisors. So let me pull this up on our website. Give me a quick second here. All right, so hopefully everybody can see the website. If you go, see the, the left column on the screen there, you can go down to colleges and universities. And then you just type in the name of your college or university here. So we might go, let's say that we're uh, looking for um, Arizona State University. That's a uh, my alma mater. And you can see right there, there's a list of your campus CLS advisors right there. And you can click right on contact to contact them. So very easy way to find your advisors uh, by going to our website. All right. Um, so, so there was a question here about the two year of college study, not necessarily linking to a certain proficiency level. Um, that is correct. Generally, though, that is considered to be intermediate once you have completed two years. Uh, now, of course, the reality is that different universities and schools will, you know, what does two years mean in terms of proficiency? There are different standards uh, in different places because the number of hours may be different. Um, the amount of curriculum covered in the class may be different. Um, some courses may focus a certain part on cultural learning rather than just language learning. So, um, so that can mean different things. That is the reality, but you will receive a placement test if accepted as a finalist and be placed into a level that is appropriate for you. Uh, there's a question about quarantine requirements to enter China. Um, and th uh, at the moment, there is a quarantine requirement for China. It's 14 days minimum. And in some cases, if traveling to another city, there's another seven days added to that quarantine. So it can be three weeks uh, or even four weeks in some cases for the quarantine. We don't know what that situation is going to be like for sure by summer of next year. Uh, and we, again, are not sure about whether or not China will start accepting student uh, or processing student visas by that time. Uh, we hope so, but uh, as I can say as of the moment, China is not processing student visas. Another great question about proof of vaccination. So uh, this, is, this is a great question. Uh, and I have to point out that the situation with COVID is quite fluid right now. So I, I can say that as of the moment, the CLS program is not requiring proof of vaccination. That is the situation at this moment. Um, whether countries or institutes might start requiring proof of vaccination, that is a possibility, um, but it, it's not something that we have seen at this point in time yet, but it is, it is possible. But I can just say at this point in time that there is no proof of vaccination required, but this is something that has the possibility of changing depending on how things go in the future. So I have a, a medical specific question and I would say if you have medical specific questions, I'd, I'd encourage you to write to us at CLS at AmericanCouncils.org um, and we can provide you answers for, for medical specific questions. Uh, 
And I have a question about self-study and how that meets the requirements for the two-year prerequisite for CLS. Uh, you know, I want to. I just want to check in with Patrick or, or Preston. Did either of you do any self-study as as meeting partially that requirement? And can you speak to that at all, as to perhaps share a bit about how how you uh, put that on your application? Yeah, I can probably speak to this because my the first time I was accepted for CLS in 2020, I only had one year of formal study, and I had something like five or six years of self-study at that point. But what I did to stand out on my application was I listed out clearly what I did for self-study. And I had a letter of recommendation from my Chinese teacher at the time that justified everything I said in the essays. Uh, so it's one thing just to talk about what you did for self-study. It's another thing to actually prove it. So if you have someone who can testify to your language abilities, whether it be a language teacher, uh, a Chinese native, just anyone who could say what your skill level is, I think that's what matters the most there. Yeah, that's great advice, Patrick. And that's something that we, we do like to tell students is that if you're not really sure whether you meet that prerequisite of having approximately two years worth of college study, it, it would be good to ask somebody who's in the know if you have access to anybody um, that would be able to give you an honest assessment. Um, but in terms of representing it on your application, it's just important to be as detailed as you can for example, talking about what were the methods you used. Um, if you used textbooks, the names of the textbooks would be helpful. Uh, if, you, if you used um, an online course, uh, what's the name of the course? How long was it? How many hours do you think you spent studying Chinese? Um, you, can, you, know, you can kind of give like a, an approximation of how many hours to date you think you've studied of Chinese um, and just try to calculate it that as best as you can. I have a question about start and end dates for the eight week period of 2022. And I will say that will vary by program site. And uh, so we don't have a definitive timeline, uh, but I can say that most programs begin in early June, uh, early to mid June, and then they end generally early to mid August. Uh, a great question about non-traditional or older students in the program. And uh, I'm really happy to see this question because we have many non-traditional students in our program. Uh, and and uh, we welcome non-traditional students. And we have had students upward of 60 plus years old participate in the CLS program. So, uh, and there is no upper age limit. So, you know, if William Shatner wanted to learn Chinese and was in a degree seeking uh, program at a, at a university, William Shatner would be able to join the CLS program, but he's too busy going to space. So, uh, but yeah, that's really important to emphasize uh, no upper age limit. If you do have to meet the eligibility requirements, as I said, be enrolled in a degree seeking program. But, um, but yeah, it, uh, the, the only age requirement is that you be at least 18 years old. Um, so I have a question about what makes an applicant really stand out. Our academic performance, GPA grade, weighted heavily. Uh, so I'll give my answer, but then I'll also let Patrick and Preston expand on that a little bit. Um, I will say that academic performance is a part of the overall picture, but there is no cutoff point for a GPA. So, uh, so that's not something that you have to worry about. You know, I'll say that generally performance in Chinese class is looked at and, and valued. So, you know, if you got a C in your Chinese class, uh, that doesn't look too good, for example. Um, so, you know, they, they want to see a commitment to the language. But in terms of, you know, other uh, grades in other fields, if, if you had some trouble one semester, um, that's not necessarily going to rule you out. Um, or, or if you had trouble in a specific class, but I would say it's valuable for you to talk about it and explain maybe what was happening there. Um, and maybe you had a good reason for it. Um, and so, you know, it's, if, it's, if it's left unaddressed, that's really kind of more of an issue. So just be sure if there is something that you're concerned about, address it in your essays. And you'll find that the selection panels are really quite reasonable. And so they'll really be um, willing to, to look at your explanations. It's when there's no explanation. That is generally what's more problematic. 
Um, Preston and Patrick, anything to add to that? Sure, I can add on. And I just kind of want to reassure some students that GPA is not the most important part of the application. Uh, I applied for CLS with a transcript that was kind of all over the place because I transferred twice. Uh, I failed some courses. It's engineering, it's pretty difficult, but the GPA was not the strongest. And I was still able to get the scholarship twice. So, I mean, if I could do it with a, a Frankenstein transcript from different universities, I'm sure most people here will qualify for it as well. Uh, it's kind of expanding upon what makes an application stand out the most. I would just like to reiterate that for me at least, though what got me the scholarship was I really focused on what I wanted to do in the future. I tried to be as specific as possible, even going so far as naming specific companies that I want to apply for. Uh, my plans for doing it, what internships I've taken, uh, where, where in China, I know semiconductors are produced. So I tried to be as specific as possible in that regard. And again, like I said uh, earlier, it almost read like a project proposal where there was numbers, there was locations, there was the amount of years I expect to take this. Uh, it's a lot better than just being wishy-washy in your statement of purpose where you say, oh, I just like learning Chinese and I wanna do it in the future. Well, do what in the future? If you can answer that question of do what in the future, that is in my mind, at least, what makes you most successful. I have to check out of my hotel now. Um, but if anybody wants to, to contact me directly or ask me any questions, um, even bounce some, some essay help off, uh, off of, I'll drop my uh, email in the, in the chat. Yeah, thank you very much, Preston. And, and yeah, thanks, Patrick, for that perspective as well. You know, and, and again, if, if you had a, a tough semester because maybe you were working a full-time job taking care of your family while you were uh, completing classes, you know, it's, it's, don't, don't feel like you can't talk about that. I think, it's, I think it's actually quite helpful to just be honest and transparent about what's happening. Um, and you, you would be surprised at, at how reasonable the selection panels will be, so. Uh, a good uh, student had a question about whether they can visit China for this trip on a travel visa. And the answer no is no, you must be on a CLS visa. That is a government requirement and the host institutes are responsible for you while you're on the program. So they must have the, the correct and proper visa uh, and that means that any students who have a valid visitor visa would have that visa canceled and replaced with a valid student visa. There may be rare cases where a student has a kind of visa that allows for them to participate on the program. And so in those cases, we would look at it on a case-by-case -case visa, uh, case-by-case basis, but generally travel visas are not accepted for study on the program and would have to be canceled. Uh, oh, how many credits are transferred over? I guess your question is how many credits do students earn through the Bryn Mawr program? And the answer is they earn two Bryn Mawr credits for the eight week CLS program. And that typically translates to, I believe it's eight credit hours. Patrick, uh, did you transfer credit? Are you, uh, is that how many that they, it, and I should also add that it varies from university to university. I would say, generally speaking, it transfers as eight credit hours uh, is, is what my re recollection is. But some universities may translate those two Bryn Mawr credits in a different way. Yeah, speaking on this, I think it was just two credits that we got. Uh, unfortunately for me, because my degree is engineering, it wasn't applicable to anything towards my degree requirements. Uh, but again, it depends on what university you're at and what program you're at, even if it depends whether or not your university will even accept it. In my case, because I'm strictly STEM, they didn't accept any of them, unfortunately. So that's good to know. I mean, I would say that generally students do have pretty good success with being able to transfer the credit to their university, especially for um, when they have language requirements for their programs. So by and large, students are able, but able to transfer them, but it is something you'd have to discuss with your, with your registrar. Uh, and a student asks if this is their second associate degree, uh, if they are eligible. And that is a good question. I would recommend asking that question to our CLS at AmericanCouncils.org uh, email address and give a little bit more specifics 
uh, about, you know, kind of, I guess the question would be, the question will be, what is the, why, why the second associate degree versus, you know, going for a bachelor's and whatnot. Um, and, and the reason for that is that some students do try to game the system a little bit. Um, and so that this would be one of those case by case basis sorts of situations. How many credits would you receive for the summer program? We already answered that. That's two Bryn Mawr credits, usually translates to uh, eight academic credit hours, but may vary by institution. All right, and we are, I think we're down to our last question. Uh, it's a question about, recommend, about a recommender, um, choosing somebody other than a Chinese language teacher for the letter, letter of recommendation. Um, and that's a great question. And, and I would say, you know, there's not a real problem with it as long as that person really can speak to your strengths as a participant in the program. Um, you know, it's possible that selection panels might look at that and ask, well, why, why not your Chinese teacher? Um, but again, you know, I think if your, recommend, if your recommender really makes a strong case for you and, and they could see that it's a really glowing recommendation, um, it doesn't necessarily have to be a Chinese teacher. And many students do not, do not use Chinese teachers. They may use professors in other areas or other subjects. But I, but I, my, I guess my only hesitation would be is if it's, if it's a language teacher, it's just to consider what's going to be best for you. If, you're, if, a, if a professor of a different language really speaks to your strengths better than, and you're, maybe you've only been in the Chinese class for, for a semester, uh, and you've studied this other language for a much longer time, and that professor knows you, you could use that. But, uh, but the question I can tell you that will come up is, it, why, why are you not studying that language? Or why didn't you apply for that language instead of Chinese? And that, that is, that's the reality is that question sometimes come up. So it comes up. So it's something to, to consider. Uh, and the question about, can the letter be written in Mandarin? Unfortunately, our selection panels cannot read Mandarin. So please do have the letter written in English. All right, and I believe that's all we have for questions. So yay, we've made it through all the questions. I wanna thank you so much for attending today's webinar. Uh, and I hope that this information was really helpful to you. And I hope you feel motivated to submit an application for this program. And just remember that the application process itself is a great way for you to start formulating your narrative about your background and telling your story. So, you know, whether you end up becoming a finalist in the end or not, this is a great opportunity to put these materials together and you'll be able to use them for other applications as well. You know, applications to other programs or, you know, some of this material may even find itself into future job interviews. So I think it is a great opportunity um, but I do hope that many of you uh, are able to become finalists in the program. And, and don't be discouraged. We've had many participants that have applied more than once. They've applied multiple years, and maybe it was the second or third application that finally got them into the program. So please don't be discouraged uh, and stay forever motivated. And I hope to see you in the program in the near future. Thanks again. And again, any further questions, CLS at AmericanCouncils.org, and we will be happy to answer any other questions you have. Thanks, Patrick. It was great to have you, and um, and I, I know that your I know that our audience found your answers uh, really insightful, and and thanks for sharing your experience. Thanks for having me, Chris, and I wish everyone the best of luck in your applications. All right, have a great one. See you all later.